Hi, my name is Dr. Henning Dagen, and today we'll be discussing the submissions for emergency use authorizations. Since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, numerous medical devices, but especially ventilators, have become scarce, which has hindered our ability to help and save the lives of many patients suffering from this respiratory infection. We're all working hard to overcome this challenge and help resolve this shortage. We have seen many companies step in uh, uh, to assist in providing either new devices or components for already existing devices as an alternative source for this type of application. With any medical device that is going to be used on a patient, uh, but especially in this case, uh, on patients that are requiring life-saving care, we need to make sure that they are biocompatible and safe to be used. However, the traditional way of verifying that a device is biocompatible for testing could be very lengthy and the need for these devices right now is urgent. Uh, we need to consider and pursue other faster options um, while al always keeping in mind that we must avoid putting the patients at unnecessary risk. This is where a risk-based approach can come into play. The US FDA and AMI have released uh, recently some guidance documents that provide useful tips on what to assess and what to look for in this risk-based approach to make sure that the devices that are authorized under the emergency use authorization are assessed appropriately before release. These guidance documents have been compiled in collaboration with the representatives from FDA, from the medical device industry, and the clinicians that are in, are in the front line of patient care. The AMI CR501 emergency use ventilator design guidance document, for example, identifies um, the clinical, engineering, and test requirements appropriate to support safe operation of emergency use ventilators to enable rapid development of these types of devices to treat patients with COVID-19 respiratory failure. The guidance states that the chosen materials for the gas pathway need to be reasonably pure and simple in nature. It also recommends to not use some materials like PVC in the gas pathway components, and whenever possible, uh, to use materials that have a long history of safe clinical use in already marketed medical devices. Thus, in general, the guidance recommends to use already known biocompatible materials to ensure that the risks from the materials themselves uh, is low. Also, if any previous testing has been already performed for biocompatibility on either the material or the device itself, like for example testing for ISO 10993 or ISO 18562, that would be really helpful in establishing and mitigating any risk for the patient as well. The guidance also um, defines that the gas pathway should be free of foreign material, including oils, uh, particulate matter, volatile organic compounds, uh, and also mold release agents should be avoided um, in the manufacture of the gas pathway um, devices. Most of these, for example, particulate matter and, and oils, uh, etc., can be uh, considered as part of the manufacturing processes. So when you are looking at the way that you are producing your device, these should be assessed as well. The particulate matter, for example, can be arising from multiple sources, but the main risks are the manufacturing environment where there's dust uh, present that could be left as a residue into the gas pathway, or when there's moving parts uh, in the, um, the gas pathway uh, device as a whole. And due to this, that there are sources of particulate matter, you need to perform a risk assessment that goes over these manufacturing steps to identify whether um, the particulate matter that could be present on the final 
gas pathway device is acceptable for the, the patient safety. For volatile organic compounds uh, or VOCs, their presence is more associated with the materials that are going to be used in the device or the component. And so if we are using commonly used materials that have already been utilized in already marketed devices, then the general risk for any VOCs arising uh, from this, the new devices is considered to be low. The US FDA guidance document enforcement policy for ventilators and accessories and other respiratory devices during the coronavirus disease 2019 public health emergency released in March 2020 indicates that to help foster the wider availability of devices for patients in need of ventilatory support, the FDA will allow modifications to the claims of intended use of the devices to help um, provide assistance in medical devices to these patients. This means, for example, that if a device has already been cleared by the US FDA for as a ventilator or a gas pathway device, this can now be used beyond its cleared use uh, parameters. For example, if it was cleared before as an intended use for home setting, it can now also be used for hospital setting because the, the risks for transferring from home setting to uh, hospital setting are in general considered to be low. Furthermore, if the device has already been cleared by other regulatory bodies, for example, in Europe or Japan or other countries, this can be used as um, supportive evidence for patient safety in the submission to the US FDA. Another example where the FDA, based on the guidance document, believes that um, the risks are low is when you need to change the material of one of the components of the gas pathway devices. Uh, in this case, however, it is highlighted that a risk assessment needs to be performed on the new material that is introduced into the gas pathway and that risk assessment should be done according to the current standards of ISO 10993 and ISO 18562 to make sure that the risks of adding this new material are still low for the patient. The performed uh, risk assessment along with the required other documentation and supportive evidence should be sent to the US FDA who will review and uh, they've all the sent in information expediously and determine on a case by case basis whether uh, emergency use authorization is warranted. Uh, Nelson Labs has been fairly busy recently in performing these uh, reviews and uh, writing up risk assessments for uh, various emergency use authorizations for submission to the FDA. So if you need any help with that, uh, let us know. So in general, uh, all of these guidance documents that have been released um, by the AME and the US FDA, they highlight that a risk assessment needs to be performed on the devices that are submitted under the emergency use authorization. Um, and a main focus of that risk assessment is the materials of construction and uh, the manufacturing processes. And this will help to um, verify or identify uh, the, the specific biocompatibility risks uh, that are associated with the specific device. It has to be, however, um, emphasized that uh, this risk-based approach uh, can be used only as a fast track uh, to get approval for emergency use authorization for the device. Um, and in parallel, it is expected that you, um, any device still undergoes the required testing, for example, particulate matter and VOCs to make sure that uh, the risks really indeed are verified to be low. Also, it has to be emphasized that when you have submitted a device under the emergency use authorization. Once this pandemic and the emergency situation is over, these devices need to be removed from the market. If you want to clear uh, these devices um, for future uh, purposes, a new submission through the FDA 
uh, using a 510k um, submission, for example, needs to be um, completed. I hope you found the video useful and uh, you now know the approach to be taken for emergency use authorization of uh, devices. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out.